welcome to the Open Systems Media eCast titled Custom OFDM Modeling and Verification. I'm Kurt Schwader, Technical Editor at Open Systems Media, and today's moderator with our speakers Richard Overdorf and Ken Volker from Agilent Technologies. Today's total briefing is scheduled for about 50 minutes, leaving a 10-minute Q&A period at the end. Uh, before we begin, let's run down some important features of your audience console. First is the Enlarge Slides button. This button will maximize the slides to fit your entire screen. You'll probably be wanting to use this button for some of the graphs shown during the presentation today. Clicking the Download Slides button will allow you to download and print the slides if you'd like a hard copy to follow along with. That's an alternative as well. The button labeled Forward to a Friend enables you to send an email to someone that will include a registration link to this eCast so they can also attend. The Ask a Question text box and associated Submit Question button allows you to participate in today's eCast. You simply type your question into the text box and submit it by clicking the button. You can submit questions at any time, and we'll do our best to address them during the closing Q&A. If you have a question or problem pertaining to the eCast operation itself, submit it, and one of our technicians will be happy to respond to you during the eCast. Now, after the Q&A portion of the eCast, there will be a closing survey that will pop up on your screen. Please take a minute and fill out that survey before leaving the eCast. Finally, this eCast will be posted online within 24 hours, and an audio podcast will also be made available. More information on this at the end of the presentation. Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiplexing, or OFDM, has emerged as a popular scheme to implement wideband digital communication over wired or wireless networks for digital television and audio broadcasting applications. Today's webcast will introduce the OFDM standards and their applications to various wireless and wireline resource configurations. Our speakers today are Ken Volker and Richard Overdorf with Agilent. Ken is a product manager for Agilent Vector Signal Analyzers. Ken is a 30-year veteran with Agilent and supports the product development function with market, customer, and application research. His involvement with vector signal analysis began at the industry's first products in the early 1990s and continues today with planning for future generations of VSAs. Ken received his BSEE from California Polytechnic State University. Richard Overdorf is a business development engineer for Agilent's electronic system level design solutions. Within Agilent, he has also served as application engineer and product manager for software platforms used with Agilent test equipment. He has written various technical papers and application notes for military communication systems. He has both a BSEE and an MBA from New Mexico State University. Ken is going to kick off today's presentation. So with that, Ken, the floor is yours. Thanks, Kurt. So as, uh, as Kurt said, we're here today to talk about design and verification of uh, RF digital comms devices and systems that use OFDM as their, as their physical layer. Why? Well, as a market planner for Agilent's uh, RF test instruments, uh, I get to look at what developers are working on across the entire comms industries. And I can tell you beyond doubt that OFDM has become the predominant file layer format. And this is for systems ranging from consumer electronics to cellular and even, even broadcast. So as we uh, work through our agenda today, we're going to start with just some real basics of uh, OFDM itself. Uh, in reality, I'm going to assume that you have some, some background there already. We're going to talk about tools for uh, developing the uh, OFDM uh, waveform um, and uh, testing it. And then we're going to go into some test techniques for verifying the signal afterwards, as well as some new tools for um, analyzing OFDM signals that are proprietary, meaning they don't conform to a particular standard because that standard may not exist yet. This is a fast-moving market, and there's a lot of new signal formats that are under development as we speak. And then lastly, we'll talk briefly about solutions from Agilent to, to help you in your design and verification. So jump again. OFDM is a modulation format first and foremost. Uh, it is the, the phi layer of an RF digital comms system. It achieves high data throughput by transmitting on many 
carriers, or we'll call them subcarriers, simultaneously. Uh, it provides high spectral efficiency because those carriers are packed together very closely. And then there are attributes of it that give it a lot of uh, data integrity, even in marginal conditions. Uh, a real simplified way to look at it is in two dimensions. Uh, each, each symbol of the OFDM signal consists of many subcarriers, which I'm showing here on the horizontal axis, numbered from zero in the center to plus and minus n on either side. For each new symbol that I transmit, I'm going to send a whole new collection of these subcarriers. Now, in real life, it's more complicated than that because the subcarriers are not all uniform, of course. They, uh, they carry data and they have different purposes. For example, typically the very first symbol transmitted is uh, called a preamble, which simply means that it has uh, predefined magnitude and phase uh, characteristics that the receiver is looking for so that it can synchronize to them. Uh, that continues to a lesser extent in further symbols uh, where there are uh, pilot subcarriers that again have a known amplitude and frequency, sorry, have a known amplitude and phase uh, that are used to um, uh, resynchronize or, or fine tune the synchronization each symbol as we go along. And then the rest of the subcarriers um, shown here in darker blue uh, are the ones that are actually carrying data and I've shown them as having different magnitudes in reality, they have different magnitudes and phases because each one of them individually represents a, a point on a constellation, um, uh, which then maps into a into one or more bits. Notice that the center subcarrier is always null, and that's uh, so that any LO feed through in the RF circuitry doesn't wipe out one of the subcarriers. It's interesting, I think, to uh, to contrast a traditional single carrier signal with OFDM. Uh, this is a frequency domain view. You notice that both signals have a have a bandwidth in the the spectrum. Uh, in the single carrier case, that bandwidth represents, as we said, just one carrier, and the uh, the, the width of the signal is proportional to the symbol rate being transmitted. Uh, any excess signal on the adjacent channel is caused by distortion and is undesirable. Contrasting that with OFDM, again, I have a, a, a width to my signal, but in this case, it's uh, composed of many ca carriers, uh, closely packed, each of which is independently modulated. Um, uh, and then the adjacent channel energy, in this case, is not due to distortion, but is due to the just the normal roll-off of the signal. In the time domain, uh, this is perhaps even, even more important. In the single carrier case, one symbol uh, represents just one point on that waveform. My receiver is going to sample that waveform. Uh, in this example, it's uh, 12 million times a second, and the instantaneous magnitude and phase at that time translates to a point on the constellation and thus to some, um, uh, some number of bits. In OFDM, I am sending many, many constellation points at a time, and in fact, my symbol is now uh, more than just one sample long. Uh, in this case of 802.11a, it's 64 samples long. So it has a width. It's not one point, but in this case, it's, it's four microseconds long, and I'm repeating at that rate. So I've gone from a one-dimensional sam um, sample and single carrier case to a, a, a sample that has a time duration to it. Another term uh, that's worth knowing is OFDMA, or the MA stands for multiple access, and that simply refers to um, the fact that when I create a signal with hundreds of subcarriers, uh, they don't they, they can be shared among multiple data streams um, destined for different users. I can simply divide up that resource proportionally depending on the throughput that I need to different users 
uh, as you can kind of see on the, the, the left-hand side here. User 1 is low rate and has a few dozen subcarriers. User 3 um, is transmitting live video and needs half the resource at that, at that moment. WiMAX uses the scheme, LTE uses the scheme, and it's, it's becoming increasingly, um, uh, increasingly common. Uh, OFDMA often uses a, uh, a picture like this to map how the resources uh, are assigned to different users as a function of time and frequency. Uh, so uh, the, the downlink burst 4 in the middle there is uh, uh, intended for one particular user. It only occurs over a subset of the um, subcarriers and a subset of the symbol times. What's nice in the scheme is that I can manage each one of those bursts independently depending on the signal, uh, the channel quality to that individual user. So uh, if I have a poor channel to user number four, I can drop back to a simple modulation format like QPSK, turn on more robust coding, and even boost the power. Whereas uh, uh, user number two, who is right next door, I can transmit a full 256 QAM at minimal power and uh, minimal um, error correction. So just to summarize that, that brief overview, again, there's three key, tree, three key attributes that make um, OFDM uh, important and, and, and useful to us. It's the, the throughput. Um, which is high due to the number of subcarriers that I am able to send simultaneously. Um, you know, literally, in, in the case of an 800 subcarrier system with a high order modulation on each subcarrier, uh, in the math example I've shown there, I can be transmitting thousands of bits for each symbol. Uh, you know, the efficiency is related to the, um, the spacing of the subcarriers. Uh, Typically, they are, are sent um, so close that they can only be separated from each other uh, mathematically. In fact, if uh, you've ever used a spectrum analyzer and tuned it on a signal, you realize you can't see individual subcarriers. It all looks like uh, random noise because the, the, the magnitude only drops by about 3 dB between uh, adjacent subcarriers and uh, the uh, Magnitude variations due to modulation are bigger than that. And then lastly, data integrity is uh, superior with OFDM. Um, that, that long symbol length is long relative to uh, impulse noise from the environment. Uh, the signal is wide and a single frequency interferer only disturbs a few subcarriers and the rest are, are still fully recoverable and uh, can be used for error correction. Those pilots that occur in every symbol can be used to resynchronize and re-equalize for each and every symbol. And then there's a, a technique called a cyclic extension that reproduces the latter part of the symbol waveform uh, up at the beginning, uh, and that has the effect of giving me some, some really nice multipath uh, immunity. Uh, and then lastly, just to underscore that initial point, I, I did a survey a while ago in which I, I mapped out the progression of phi layers from analog and single carrier modulation to OFDM, which I'm showing in green here. And if you look, every in every market segment from personal area networking like Bluetooth to wireless LAN, broadcast, um, all of them are, are, are moving or have moved to OFDM. I mean, even mobile um, cellular telephony uh, back in the uh, early part of this uh, of the decade, it, it looked like CDMA was going to take over cell comms and become the dominant standard. And now with uh, LTE and LTE Advanced, even that's moving to to OFDM because of the advantages we we talked about. So the the challenge in in development is to um, not so much um, you know, do the do the basic math, but rather to figure out what does this waveform need to look like. You know, 
how many carriers uh how how do i manage the the pilots where where should the pilots be how many of them and just a a myriad of decisions that all uh come down to um uh, basically what we call the 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 system architecture or the waveform architecture all of those decisions and uh Ricky Overdorf is is now going to talk about tools uh, that are used to make those kinds of decisions. Ricky? Thanks, Ken. Yeah, so as Ken mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about some OFDM system architectures. Uh, in general, I think it's really important to to review some of these challenges. And, uh, and in particular, we're going to talk about kind of what the system architect looks at and what are some of the what are some of the views that they look at? As you see there on the in the green area, this is kind of an OFDM uh, transmitter design uh, and specific blocks that that build that OFDM system. Uh, specifically, as Ken mentioned in the physical layer, we're going to talk uh, particularly to that today. Um, so we spend where do we spend the energy and and where do we make adjustments? As you see in red, we have some potential issues if we do have uh, have some design issues that we we run into. So assuming that the system architect was, was handed a set of requirements for that system design, uh, primarily those are cost, range, uh, data rate, uh, another one could be reliability of that channel, Do you, can you tolerate some bit error rates? Um, uh, another thing that you might want to look at is if that physical layer is now designed, what are the, are the goals that you want to accomplish? And so I kind of listed some here on this slide. You know, of course you want the high throughput, you want it to be reliable. Uh, peak to average power ratio is a, is a very common problem that you see in OFDM type uh, format. Um, I'm going to touch on some of uh, some more specifics about these, as I said earlier, in, uh, in in some preceding slides. But I would also like to uh, take a quick look at some of the design options that we have and and what are what can we do. So Ken kind of gave us an overview uh, of that already. But you know, number of subcarriers, what's the spacing and the bandwidth. Um, are we going to put some FPGA resources into encoding and interleaving? Um, what modulation order do we use? Uh, of course, the length of that cyclic prefix that you talked about or the guard interval. Um, and then preamble pilot structures. And there's really much, much more that we could talk about. Um, but we're going to give a, a high-level look about that. So we also have a, a kind of a I'm, – I'm taking a, a look at a frame structure here. and. I, there's a whole bunch of different things that the industry, as, as Ken mentioned, is doing uh, for constant envelope uh, OFDM, uh, MIMO techniques, so uh, smart antenna techniques, uh, multi-input, multi-output. Uh, Ken mentioned OFDMA. There's really a lot of those that are out there. I'm going to take kind of a, a, a typical bursted signal, what you could maybe think of as an 802.11a signal. Um, where you have an, an, some idle time, then you have your burst, uh, and then your frame structure looks like one, most likely two preambles, and then you have some data that's sent. And in particular, here we have two blocks of, of data that we're going to we're going to look at. Um, uh, one key decision made uh, that you might want to look at here is what is the modulation order for those data blocks, and and uh, there's a lot that goes into that design and and to determine that. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, you may want to use a higher order, of course, to get the higher throughput, but then you run into inner symbol and inner carrier interference problems potentially, uh, depending upon um, a multitude of factor, factors. Excuse me. If you have a, a lot of uh, channel issues, you could potentially have some some issues there. So you might have to extend your uh, your cyclic prefix or your your uh, delay spread uh, to cover for for some of those problems. But a lot of that goes into deciding what what parameters that you use. So to quickly take a look uh, at, Ken mentioned the preamble structure, so um, to quickly take a look at that, in general, there are multiple types of preambles, of course, that, that you could decide to use. Uh, the primary goal is establishing automatic gain control and synchronization, frequency synchronization for your, uh, for your receiver. Um, there are, like I said, there's many uh, structures. MIMO is a, something where a lot of people are doing work in preamble uh, design for, for multi-input, multi-output type applications. Um, here I'm showing one basic implementation parameter. Uh, the, spa uh, the sequencing, excuse me, can be done both the time or frequency domain. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about this in, in uh, the presentation. Uh, and 
Here you see the length L where uh, is, is the length of the prefix, or excuse me, the preamble. We also have an applicable uh, garden overall or cyclic prefix that we can append to the beginning or the end. Um, also common to see multiple types of preambles where you have long and short, for example, with 802.11a where uh, the long is, uh, excuse me, the short is for kind of the uh, uh, broader uh, synchronization and the long is for fine tuning um, the synchronization. So a lot of different things we can do in the preamble. So another, another design parameter where we want to we wanna consider uh, um, some structuring there. So another thing that Ken mentioned was the pilot structure. So there's a whole lot of different pilot structures and a lot of research that goes into um, to what pilot structures work and what type of environments to keep the synchronization or to, to be able to account for uh, multi-path effects and, and channel changes that you may have uh, for your, uh, your link. Um, what are some of the things that we can do? Well, I, I have four here pictured. Uh, you see no pilot, uh, continuous pilot, scattered pilot, and then, of course, uh, a combination of the two. And even in the scattered pilot sense, there's a lot of different scheming that you can do that is not quite as uniform as the picture here shows um, that has different types of results depending upon the different type of link that you have. Um, so there's a lot of different things that, uh, that are important here. You can see for uh, digital video type formats, we'll have something like uh, kind of a combination of the two. Um, and of course, for a lot of the mobile type communications, you'll see some scattered pilot type applications. And then of course, for 802.11a, you, you have a, a continuous pilot type application. So you, you see a, a gambit of these throughout, um, throughout different OFDM uh, waveform design and implementations. So another problem that a lot of a lot of people want to take into account for is you, you, with OFDM, uh, as Ken showed in the slide, where we had a, a waveform with some with some roll off. He talked about the single carrier format, where that's actually distortion. Uh, in in the case of uh, OFDM, we have uh, the, the sync type function, where we have we have a natural roll off. Um, one thing that we want to consider when we have this overlap, obviously this, this is uh, determined by the number of subcarriers and their spacing. So uh, you can adjust that to try and take care of that. But another, another, cap another way to try and mitigate um, wide roll off is to use some windowing, a symbol windowing. Um, that does have some trade-offs, of course, like anything. Uh, this rectangular pole shaping can induce some phase discontinuity. It also has um, a reduction in the multipass fading immunity. So two kind of negatives that kind of come with that. But again, it's very important in many cases use. We have an implementation we'll talk about a little later on the, a root rate cos or excuse me, a race cosine uh, windowing technique that we're, we're going to employ. Um, but again, very important to uh, to try and to make sure you have nice roll off and you don't have a lot of out of band energy bleeding into into other channels that you may not want. So uh, we have a just to talk a little bit more on the next slide about uh, payload and symbol symbol structure. Um, let's see. Uh, the guard interval and cycle prefix now is, is of course determined by the channel order. I kind of talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, this delay spread that we talk about directly it dictates this guard time or guard interval. It's generally about two to four times the root mean square of that of that delay spread. Uh, in part, it, it influences the type of coding. Um, I mentioned the different types of QAM modulation. If you wanted to go to higher order QAM, uh, of course, like I mentioned, it's more sensitive to inner carrier, inner symbol interference than we would get with the QPSK type uh, modulation format. Um, heavier coding obviously reduces the sensitivity to some of these interferences. And again, this is the point that there's a lot of dynamic uh, properties here that you can trade things off to. Uh, to try and mitigate some of these concerns that you may have. Um, zero padding can also be used, as you see in the bottom section, uh, to help that symbol recovery. And again, this is, this is the structure that I'll be talking about a little bit later on in, in our presentation. So we, um, we also, going back to that slide with uh, the structure, we talked about some of the, um, uh, some of the at a very, very high level about some of the parameters that we have for our OFDM design, waveform design. Um, once you do get to a point where you have that design and you do have some problems, or maybe you just want to you want to optimize your design, um, what do you change and how do you fix it? And then 
like I mentioned multiple times, and you've kind of heard it sprinkled in, you have a, uh, a situation where if you do change something to, to make something better, it potentially has a trade off, a negative trade off uh, that affects other things. So, how do you know that you made all the correct choices? Are, are you know, to go back through that list, do you, do you, do you change something and then say, okay, it's finished? No, generally what you need to do is uh, you need to do some system tests. So um, we're going to talk about how do we do that in a more efficient manner rather than start from the beginning and, and really have a, a long iteration process uh, to make sure that you've, you've made all the correct choices. So again, looking at some of these, uh, you know, easy to disrupt, not, not efficient enough. Uh, we have some synchronization issues. We have some channel issues. We talked about you know, carrier interference issues. Um, a lot of these, Ken's going to talk about in the later part of the presentation and going to go through how to troubleshoot these. But in general, once we do find them, how, how can we correct them and how can we make sure they're correct or that, the, that the, the solution that we came up with is now uh, doesn't create other problems. So I have here uh, a list of, of kind of change these to blue with a check mark and say, okay, how did we fix some of these problems? And just, just at a high level to touch on some of these. Um, we did some better encoding, and that can do a multitude of things. Um, obviously, the trade-off there is you're going to have uh, more FPGA resources potentially or more um, uh, resources that you use for power consumption uh, if you use higher, higher in, uh, interleaving encoding schemes. Um, also, if you want better throughput, we talked about just the simple uh, solution of let's, let's map this to a higher order format. Um, of course, doing that again, like I mentioned, has, has effects throughout the system. Uh, we haven't synchronization problems. We did some preamble adjustments. Uh, maybe we used the new preamble scheme. Um, we have a poor, maybe we used a, a, a MIMO type technique where we did multi and uh, smart antenna technique. Uh, we have something where we, we have a, we, it worked great in the lab, but now when we're in different environments, we're noticing that we're, we're having some, some, uh, some, bad uh, issues, maybe we can go back to the pilot structure and, and check that to see if maybe we can, we can hold that and, and kind of account for those channel effects and, and again, go through and, uh, and optimize that. Uh, also, intercarrier and intersymbol problems, uh, you know, we can change that, uh, that delay spread or that cyclic prefix or, or go through some, some better encoding techniques. Um, those are some, some methods to try and counter that. Uh, we have too much out-of-band energy. Uh, we talked about a windowing technique. You can use higher weighting. Um, potentially, of course, like I mentioned, that creates some other problems. Um, uh, peak to average power ratio is really too high. That sometimes is, is manifested, of course, at, you know, at, at the, in the baseband as well. But uh, the RF and IF as well, some of amplifier problems come into effect. You can employ uh, the, the different schemes for that, uh, maybe you employ a, a clipping scheme. We're going to talk about another type of uh, peak to average power ratio reduction technique uh, in this presentation. Um, but in general, that can create problems. Maybe you do some pre-distortion, and then you want to see how that works with the system. Um, but there's a lot of different, different ways to touch this. Now, how do they all dynamically uh, work together? So... Um, now I want to quickly go through um, what what rapid waveform development techniques can we have where we don't end up causing problems. So we talked about the waveforms. I think it's I think we can all agree it's very dynamic. We have a, a lot of knobs or things to tweak um, that 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 both uh, can positively influence the system as well as sometimes negatively uh, affect our system. But of course the goal is to maximize our performance. So. We want to do that, and we want to do that in a timely manner, and I think we're going to go through some, some ways to, to be able to do that. So, of course, specifically looking at physical air design, um, we have this product called System View, uh, and I'm going to show you how some, some strategies or some sort of techniques with this product that we can, we can do some rapid waveform development as, and, as well as do some troubleshooting in the design environment to tr really try and um, make make our waveform and do some testing uh, specifically uh, quickly. And, and one of the things that you see very often is that a lot of companies kind of have a siloed approach or, or kind of a, a traditional design approach where you, you, know, you have maybe a DSP designer who's, who's, who's writing a C++ code 
and they have their own flow, and you can kind of see that in each of these columns where it's kind of a vertical flow. Uh, the key to this product system view is that it, it really has integration. It can handle a, a multitude of different formats. It's a, you're going to see some pictures of it here in a little bit, but it's a, it's a model-based design, but it really encompasses uh, kind of four major, major areas. Um, it supports, like I said, different formats. Uh, you can see here we got C++, Verilog, VHDL, um, uh, as well as math language or MATLAB type code. Uh, so there's a lot of different coding schemes as, as well as uh, libraries, as you see, which is another component. Um, in particular, we're going to talk about uh, OFDM block sets that we have that are uh, already IP that's created that you can leverage, as well as using that those libraries as verification uh, benchmarks, so like a golden standard type situation in your design methodology. Uh, in addition to that, you have uh, kind of the last an RF system where your, your RF uh, engineers are also doing design, and if you are an RF engineer, this product is also very exciting uh, because of the fact that it it um, it can help tie X parameter nonlinear type um, analog components in with baseband a, a very accurate baseband environment. So you have the combination there where you can really tie all of this together to make sure that that things work. Now, how does that help us in OFDM creation? So as you see here, um, we have on the right, this is the system view environment, and you can, if you, if you do maximize the screen, you actually can, can kind of get a look at what that looks like, or uh, of course download the uh, presentation. Uh, you'll see on the right there's some, blo uh, some blocks that are added together or, or in series to, to design a, a system, as well as uh, gra different graphs so you can do verification. Um, but in particular, what we're going to show is uh, those blocks that we have, we've taken them and we have made OFDM blocks. And if you can see them, they're specific for each channel. And of course, it's not just um, six blocks here that create an OFDM waveform. We actually have more than that. But, but in particular, FFT um, FFT blocks, or you, we also have a um, subcarrier muxing mapping. The different uh, specific things, guard insertion block. We have blocks for each one of those, uh, and so you can. You can use these blocks to to more quickly uh, develop OFDM waveforms. And in addition to that, we have a, a new thing where, based on some some customer uh, input, we've we've developed a, a single graphical user interface. And even if you don't use this product in particular, this is a this is a good um, thought to to maybe take your own tools that you're using and and try and uh, implement something like this because of the dynamic nature and and a lot of the flexibility that you get with OFDM. So we took the the uh, the specific uh, parameters of these blocks and we've extracted them to a high level graphical user interface, uh, which you see on the upper left there. And we're, we'll quickly walk through some of these tabs and we're creating a waveform in an in an environment where we can do it very quickly and adjust it and and have kind of a uh, somewhere where if you're do doing some silo type design that you can also. Uh, use this in conjunction with it to kind of plug the holes, uh, plug the design holes uh, fairly quickly without having to uh, to do a lot of work on your own. So I'm going to uh, walk through some of the creation examples. So here you see some system parameters. Um, uh, what we have here is a, a uh, OFDM system parameters for frequency, et cetera. Uh, as well as power, those types of things, your oversample ratio. You can see here we have uh, the guard interval subcarriers, the FFT size. Um, in addition, preamble parameters, whether we – I mentioned we would talk a little about this, so frequency domain or time domain, um, whether you're going to put the – do your design in either of those for the preamble, you can, you can dynamically change that, um, as well as the different sequencing parameters and the indexing. Uh, in addition, uh, the data, how you're going, what exactly, how are you going to do your, uh, how are you going to implement your, your structuring for your data? Are you going to use a, a uh, QAM scheme, QPSK scheme? Or if you want something specific, a specific, a specific mod type, uh, you can also do a custom scheme. Um, and again, uh, some piloting schemes here, you can also do a custom scheme or import your own scheme, but a, a rapid prototype and a lot of the waveforms are already um, are already here for, for demonstration examples. Um, also, uh, peak to average power ratio, we have an example here of a DVB-T2 algorithm that we've implemented um, to do peak to average power ratio. Uh, 
uh, reduction. Basically, what this is in, in, a, in a really high level is, um, you know, we have all these OFDM subcarriers, and they're all could potentially add constructively, uh, depending upon, as we mentioned, what the phase is of each of those. Uh, and if that happens, uh, obviously you have a, a very large peak to average power ratio. And if you have that situation, um, you're going to run into problems in multitude of areas. Specifically, uh, amplifiers do not like that. Um, this technique is is it's not a clipping technique, so it's virtually distortionless. Um, but basically what it does is it it takes some subcarriers and it uses them to actually um, destructively, algorithmically destructively um, uh, subtract from the peak to average power ratio. So another technique. So the point of this is that there's different algorithms you can also apply and there's different sections of that that you can apply if you wanted to do more deeper dives into, into algorithm development for your OFDM waveform. So now I'd like to turn it over to Ken. Uh, he's going to review some identification and troubleshooting techniques for OFDM. Okay. So um, once we have uh, decided on a, a waveform architecture, a waveform format, and uh, realized it either in the simulator or at PGA or, or maybe even for silicon, we have the challenge of uh, uh, validating that the modulation quality is uh, is up to snuff, and if not, figuring out exactly why. Let's take a couple of minutes to look at that. Uh, in order to measure modulation quality, I first have to um, demodulate it, and that process uh, uses an FFT to convert from the time domain. Uh, so I'm going to take that block of waveform that represents one symbol, I'm going to perform the, the fast Fourier transform, and uh, that will result in a, an array of frequency points, each of which represents one subcarrier. And then each of those subcarriers has a magnitude and phase that corresponds to a point on a constellation, which gives me the data bits that I'm looking for. So constellation error uh, is is a standard um, uh, standard measurement that uh, we already have tools to create, and so they're simply adapted for for OFDM. Uh, the metric I'm going to use is called EVM, and it uh, is a measure of the magnitude of the distance between the uh, where that constellation point ended up on the um, on the observed signal versus the ideal location. The only thing that's different here is that uh, now I have one constellation point for each subcarrier, and then that whole array is repeated symbol by symbol by symbol. So I get kind of an interesting display problem if I want to see all this data, and that's handled with these uh, displays, which have now become standard on um, uh, OFDM-oriented instruments. We invented this display format back in the early 2000s, and uh, pretty much it's used universally by everyone now. Uh, on the top um, trace here, uh, this is a, a display of error versus time, with each vertical column having a, a, a grouping of individual error points, each one representing one subcarrier. So I have this many, so I have um, uh, a collection of, I have all my subcarriers for the first symbol, then the next, then the next, then the next. So I can see that distribution. Or if I just want to see the average error for that symbol, not the individual subcarriers, then I look at the heavy blue line. The converse is true on the lower trace. Now I'm looking at it subcarrier by subcarrier by subcarrier but I also have the ability to see the individual symbols. And I'll show you in some case studies here uh, how that display is useful. But uh, at the end of the day, you end up with uh, a modulation quality display that might look like this, where I get a look at the raw constellation, again, overlaying all subcarriers and all symbols onto a constellation diagram. And then uh, lower left is my EVM as a function of time, so I can see if there's any uh, time varying um, element to the to the error, or the EVM versus frequency in the upper right. 
the examples I'm going to show you here for the next few minutes are, are based on Agilent's um, signal analyzer product called the 89600 VSA. And this is a, a um, analysis tool that works in conjunction with your benchtop instruments. In essence, the, the, the instruments, whether it's a traditional spectrum analyzer or a scope or even a logic analyzer, sample at appropriate test points within your block diagram and they acquire the signal waveform at that point, whether it's at RF or IQ baseband or even as uh, uh, words on a digital bus, it acquires that waveform and then the software analyzes it and produces the measurements uh, that we're going to look at. So let's look at five different kinds of errors that pop up and uh, how they appear on the measurement tools and uh, a little bit about um, how I will, how I can recognize them and, and what they mean. In the first case, again, here's my, my same display. Um, I've got a, an EVM number, my average EVM number doesn't look good. And so um, the thing that catches my attention immediately is that lower left-hand display where I see that the, the EVM is increasing dramatically as a function of time. Okay, something's, you know, something's not right there that I need to, to troubleshoot. Probably the easiest way to, to troubleshoot that is to use a, a setting within the analyzer that allows me to compensate for different types of impairments individually. And so I'll try them one at a time and see the effect on the, on, on the constellation and uh, understand whether perhaps it is that impairment that's, that's causing me trouble. In the, the top diagram, uh, I'm tracking just timing errors uh, with no effect. In the second display, I'm, I'm tracking out phase errors, um, which is helping me a little bit. But, but in the third one, I've totally cleaned up the signal by, by tracking out amplitude variations. And so my conclusion in this case is, is pretty simple. I just had a, a amplitude, probably a, a, a droop in my signal. Uh, as a function of time. Normally, you don't compensate these errors or track them out uh, because you want to see the impairments and measure it, quantify it, and not just hide it. So the default would be to leave these off. Uh, we have a display called common pilot error that actually lets you see um, the uh, amount of defect that you tracked out. And so on that upper left-hand display, I'm seeing um, that the amplitude tracking was, uh, was um, boosting the signal back up by about a dB of amplitude uh, over that 240 microsecond period. Okay, so tracking tools let me um, isolate and quantify certain kinds of uh, time or phase varying um, errors. Second example is a uh, classic one that we see a lot. Um, I look first at the constellation diagram and there seems to be a rotational um, smearing to it. Now, in, back in the old days when I was looking at just a single carrier um, constellation uh, and I saw some um, uh, rotation to the constellation like that, you know, it, it was you'd immediately conclude that this was phase noise because that's, that's how phase noise affects a constellation. However, I've already turned on pilot phase tracking uh, from our previous example, and so it can't be phase noise. So what's, what's, what's going on here? Well, the, the fact of the matter is that um, because of how OFDM works, the constellation points are not just a point in time, they're also a point in time and frequency because I've, I've not only got all the symbols overlaid on each other, I've also got the subcarriers overlaid on each other. And so in this case, um, the, the error was not progressing as a function of time, but rather as a function of offset from the center frequency. In fact, it was doing so linearly, and that's what that V-shaped plot is all about. And if you um, if you work through the the math and you 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 think about a collection of subcarriers whose um, whose frequency.
frequency or the, the phaser for that subcarrier is rotating faster and faster and faster, the further offset you are from, uh, from the center, right, because they're all at higher frequencies, increasing frequencies relative to the center, so their phasers are rotating more quickly. That means for a given um, time error, like a, a time offset, I'm going to accumulate more error the further uh, I'm going to accumulate more error during that time period as a function of how far away from the uh, center frequency I am. So um, uh, once you've tried that a while, uh, you look at a V-shaped EVM plot and know instantly that that is uh, going to be a timing error of some sort. It may be time skew between your I and Q waveforms, or it may simply be that your, your symbol clock is uh, uh, is not running at the same um, is not running at the the, the right frequency. We uh, worked with uh, one manufacturer who um, was getting this error on the proto boards that they were shipping to their their customers for their chipset, and it turned out that in order to keep the cost of their prototype boards low, they were using a simple crystal oscillator and a uh, it was battery powered. And uh, the frequency was was all over the place, including the symbol clock frequency. And so, um, because of that imprecision, uh, they were seeing this kind of EVM. Single frequency interferer um, shows up very clearly on the uh, on the display uh, as a high EVM spike. Uh, you can see in the upper right hand trace here uh, a big spike in this case on subcarrier minus 24. Now the the overall impact on the average EVM isn't very big, but uh, I still would like to know that that is happening. And in fact, I'd like to troubleshoot that. One capability in the tool is to um, focus in and say, I only want to see my error statistics as applied to that single carrier. And by doing so, um, you know, this is now a one subcarrier OFDM uh, signal in essence. And uh, I can use all of those metrics against that, that one subcarrier. You know, interestingly, in this case, I, I end up, uh, I took my error signal and uh, showed it on a polar plot in the lower left-hand corner there, uh, zooming in on it some. And uh, without going into the details here, there were some uh, useful things I was able to derive about the probable cause of that just by looking at the error signal. Uh, Ricky talked about uh, managing the peak to average ratio and uh, uh, as you as you experiment with that, you would use uh, displays like this, um, particularly the uh, what's called the CCDF, um, which is a, a measure of peak to average ratio as a function of probability. You can see a slight difference in those two between the case of no clipping and some minor clipping. It's a real sensitive metric. Um, uh, again, it's on it's on the displays on the bottom where, uh, with no clipping, my curve proceeds smoothly um, uh, and follow, follows a, uh, a smooth curve. Whereas that 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 trace starts to uh, get truncated at the same time that my um, signal peaks become truncated. And then lastly, just let me jump right to uh, a display of what IQ impairments can do to you. This is a case where I, I just have a, a bad looking signal in general. However, as I look at it, I notice that my, my, my pilots, you know, we haven't talked about this yet, but if you look at the constellation, I've got a 64 QAM constellation superimposed on a BPSK constellation. Those are the the dots, uh, the horizontal set of dots uh, just inside the boundaries of the, the constellation box. Those are my pilots. In this particular case, though, my pilots um, have separated into two vertical dots, and that's because with IQ impairments, I end up um, creating images uh, of the signals that reflect across to the um, frequency symmetrically on the other side of DC and interfere um, with its partner 
at uh, at the symmetrical frequency. Try to show it graphically here um, that uh, when you have a signal interfering with an image of itself, you can end up with uh, a constellation like the type we've we've shown here. Um, you can you can read a fuller explanation of that in the uh, the PDF version of these slides, but uh, for now I'd like to uh, proceed on to um, uh, just a few comments on analyzing proprietary OFDM signals, and this is a this is a new capability from from Agilent that uh, is just coming to market right now, and it is a user configurable OFD, OFDM demodulator. Um, as you might think, that is, uh, there are so many variables in an OFDM signal that it, it, it requires a lot of in-depth knowledge about the signal to uh, configure it, and, and that is absolutely true. The, the DMOD needs to know all of those time and frequency and FFT parameters. It needs to know where are the preamble subcarriers, where are the pilots, um, and because those are reference signals, what are the expected IQ values? so it can use them as references, and then uh, it needs to know information about the modulation formats on the, the data, data subs. What that looks like um, in, a, in a measurement tool is um, uh, something like this. This is, it's still the same analyzer, it's just a new um, optional feature here. And uh, there is a procedure that, um, that looks like, oh, I'm sorry, there is a, a, a uh, user input menu that uh, has basically two parts. In the middle there it says basic FFT parameters where you describe to the analyzer that this is N number of subcarriers and uh, uh, what is the, the, freak, the, the sample rate by which they were generated, uh, some information about guard intervals and um, guard subcarriers that's entered manually, and then there are four configuration files that describe the signal to the analyzer, to the demodulator, subcarrier by subcarrier, and symbol by symbol. Now these are fairly um, simple text files. I'll show you just just one example of the kinds of information that the analyzer needs to know. This is this is one called a, a resource map, and uh, it's an example for 802.11a. And you'll see that I simply have a row of values for each symbol, um, and then within each row, I'm going to uh, have one number per subcarrier, and that number in this case describes what is the function of the subcarrier at that time. Uh, for example, in 802.11a, I have two preamble symbols up front where every third subcarrier is turned on and is used as a preamble and then it is followed by three null subcarriers, those are those that are turned off, and you can kind of see that in the pattern. That's followed by two symbols where every subcarrier is turned on, and then followed by uh, other symbols where uh, it's predominantly data subcarriers represented by zero and pilot subcarriers represented by one. So the, the, the setup process involves um, creating these configuration files generally once, uh, and they are to match whatever new um, OFDM system architecture you've, you're, you've developed, you're working on. There are four configuration files uh, listed up there that describe various aspects of the signal. We've included some features that will simplify the configuration. There is some auto detection of certain elements of the, the waveform, um, uh, such as the, the target values for pilots and some of the modulation formats. There's ability to um, loop continuously um, through certain symbols so that you don't have to describe every symbols if every symbol if they're repetitive and and, and so on. So this, this feature is available today, and um, given the number of new OFDM formats that are underway right now, uh, we believe it'll be useful to, to a lot of folks. So I'm going to turn it over to, to Ricky uh, one last time and uh, let him uh, just give you a high-level view of the uh, collection of tools that Agilent offers uh, for OFDM generation and analysis. 
Thanks again. So real quickly, um, I just want to make one point. So system view we talked about and we talked about uh, VSA or Ken talked about VSA. So these two products can work in unison. As a matter of fact, we can those configuration files that Ken just mentioned, we can actually uh, export those from your waveform design into the VSA so you can analyze the waveform you created. Uh, in conjunction with that, Ken mentioned that the that VSA connects to instrumentation. System View also connects to instrumentation and, and can offer you a, a large benefit with uh, verification. Um, now just to just to kind of summarize uh, what we talked about today. So there's some there's here's some links here for you guys to get some more information. If you want more information on specific specifically on system view and VSA a demo on on uh, on how we create these waveforms we have one on YouTube there's a link there um, as well as some application notes that you can use or view uh, and of course there's the VSA uh, the new VSA B or the new uh, um, 89601B uh, link as well that that Ken previously just talked about um, so with that, I think uh, I can pass it over to Kurt, and Very we good. can maybe take some questions. Yes, uh, jam-packed full of information. Um, we'd want to encourage you to continue to submit questions. We may not get uh, to them because of the abbreviated Q&A, but please uh, do so, and Agilent will be happy to get back to you. Uh, first question is on slide 11. Uh, in terms of the benefits of OFDM and um, in terms of the signal characteristics uh, were described, um, are there any associated capacity or speed characteristics or advantages that that make it so people are going to OFDM for all those applications on slide 11? Yeah, that's a uh, a good point of clarification. You know, if if you're talking about just the raw bit density, you know, how many bits per second can I transmit per hertz of bandwidth? OFDM really is 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 no better or worse than most single carrier formats. The the real advantage boils down to um, uh, its 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 robustness, its um, ability to you know uh, tolerate poor channels. And then we could go off and talk for half an hour about MIMO, which is um, greatly facilitated uh, by some of the characteristics of, of OFDM. Okay. So it's a robustness thing, not a raw speed thing. I see. Um, in terms of uh, if somebody is already using MATLAB for any of their modeling, uh, how can they use what they already have with what you've shown today? So that's a good question. So uh, we we have the ability for uh, specifically for System View to uh, implement M code as I as I previously mentioned, but. Uh, so you can create algorithms inside of System View, but if you have some code that you already have developed and you have a MATLAB license, um, System View offers a very tight integration with MATLAB. Uh, so you can actually, uh, with just a, a one command, uh, in, implement your MATLAB uh, applications inside of System View. So we do have an integration, and I believe uh, Ken also has some integration uh, with VSA as well. Yeah, the, uh, if you use MATLAB to create a um, simulated waveform as a .mat file, that can be read by the VSA and analyzed um, in a, in a post-processing mode, the same as if it were a, a live signal. Very good. Uh, here's another question on the uh, phase noise. How critical is phase noise in an OFDM system with longer symbol periods? In a nutshell, the, the impact of phase noise um, decreases with, with longer symbol periods. Um, we, we talked about the fact that um, uh, through the use of the pilots, we can resynchronize uh, each time there's a, a new symbol sent. So therefore, if I have uh, low frequency phase noise that's on the order of the symbol rate, that I'm actually tracking out that phase noise as I go. Good rule of thumb is that um, uh, phase noise that is um, uh, less than about a tenth of the symbol rate um, is tracked out and invisible to me. I see. Okay. Uh, very good. How, here's one with secure signals. They deal with secure signals. Uh, how can custom or secure baseband encoding and encryption functions be added to the general purpose OFDM formats that were presented here today? So, so uh, typically uh, uh, this is something that you can do with system view. So you can use the uh, 
the creation uh, method that I mentioned in, in the part of the presentation uh, with the, our graph, graphical user interface, but you can also um, just add proprietary blocks to that simulation chain and then you can add, using a variety of languages and formats, uh, as I mentioned about MATLAB and, and other types of formats, C, C code, um, and, and then implement those, uh, that IP there as well. Okay. Very good. Um, unfortunately, we've gotten to the end of our Q&A period. Um, we'd like to thank so much the audience for attending today's eCast. And a big thank you to uh, Richard and Ken for taking the time to be with us and share some important insights into the world of OFDM. This eCast will be posted online at the URL shown on your screen, and an audio-only podcast version will be made available. You can do a web search with the keywords embedded space e-cast and find all of the Open Systems Media eCasts available for download as MP MP3s. We'd also like you to take uh, time to fill out the survey here that will be popping up on your screen shortly. And thank you all for attending, and have a great day.